Okay, so back to the topic of building. We've now got a pretty good understanding of the basic contents that make up an OCI compliant image. But how do we actually go about making our own layers and our own config files that indicate how the container should be pieced together at runtime? Well, there's two primary ways of doing this. We can use tools like Docker or Podman with a Docker file, which is now, by the way, also sometimes called a container file. For using OCI compliant tools other than Docker, like Podman and Builder, just on that, in terms of capability, Podman is everything Docker is and more. So if you're on Linux, I suggest installing the Podman tool instead of Docker. And I'll talk more about the differences between the two in the running containers video. But for now, you can literally actually create an alias for Docker pointing to Podman if you wanted to. And all your favorite Docker commands will continue to work exactly as you'd expect. Now, option number two would be building from the command line. And to do that, we can use a tool called Builder. Now, both options can get you the same result. In my opinion, the Docker file is easier to grasp and start with, but the CLI based builder method definitely has its advantages that the Docker file approach just can't provide. So we're going to take a look at both of these methods and we'll start with the Docker file. So to start, you'll obviously want to make sure that you have Docker installed on either your Windows or Mac. To do this, you can head to the Docker site. And you can see on the left of the screen, you have Docker desktop and you can select either Mac or you can scroll down a little bit and there's also Windows as well. Now let's go back to our demo app and have a look at the Docker file that's in that app. So this is an example of a Docker file. Each new line in this Docker file directly corresponds to a new layer in the union file system. Now we'll quickly go through what each of these lines is actually doing in a moment. But if you need to read more or want to learn more about the Docker file API, you can head over to the Docker site and have a read through that as well. It's called Docker file reference. And you can see on the right hand side of the screen, you have all the commands that can be included in a Docker file. Now, in terms of what this file here is doing, we can start from the top. The from directive indicates to the build tool that in this case, it should pull the node 14 container image and use that as the base layer for the container that we're going to build. So in short, we're going to build on top of the Node 14 image that's supplied by Node.js and made available in Docker Hub. If we go to Docker Hub, we can actually see this. And here we can see all the tags that are, that are supported for Node. So we've used this tag here, just the number 14. And in this particular Docker file, we're doing a multi-stage build, which means that we've got two from directives so when we have two froms, we need to give each of the containers a unique name. So this file is really creating two separate containers. On lines three and four, we set some environment variables. On line six, we set a working directory. And all this means is that we're creating a directory and any subsequent commands that we issue in the Docker file will be applied to that working directory. We then copy all the contents from our local directory on the host OS into the containers working directory. So at this point, you can imagine that we're inside the container, we're inside the slash app directory, and we have all the files from the left of the screen on the host. We have them available to us inside the container now. So the next directive is to do an NPM install, which just installs all the dependencies for the Next.js application. After that, we run an NPM build, and that will build the application. And then we leave that container there. So the container has all the source code, but it also has the compiled application as well. Then on line 14, we start up a new container that we're calling prod. And now we're building this container with a base image of the Node 14 Alpine version of Node.js, which is just a much smaller distribution in terms of size. Again, we set a couple of environment variables. We run an expose command just to indicate to whoever chooses to run this container that there is a service inside the container that needs to listen on port 3000. We then install using APK, which is the package manager tool for Alpine Linux. We install a tool called stress ng, which is definitely not necessary for the web app, but it's going to help prove some points towards the uh, end of this video series when we're running containers and we want to uh, do some testing. Once again, we set the working directory in this prod container to slash app as well. And then we start copying files from the build machine. So you can see here that we've, we're copying the node modules that's created with the npm install command on line 10. We're copying those node modules into the second production container. We're copying the .next directory, which contains all the compiled code. And then we're copying the public directory as well. 
because there's nothing special about that public directory, it hasn't had any processing done or anything like that from the original build image that could have been copied from the local host as well. Now, the reason we have these two different container images is that the build image actually contains all the source code and a lot of things that we don't want in the final image that just kind of bloats the size. So by creating this two-stage or this multi-stage build, the production image can just copy over the compiled code and the node modules that are necessary to run in a production environment rather than having all the assets bundled in with it from the, from the get-go and then have all these unused files just remaining around on the file system. And then last up, we have the entry point, which is the command that will be run as soon as the container is executed. So in this case, next start, we'll start our web app. All right, to build this is quite straightforward. We just wanna make sure that we're in the same directory as the Docker file, and we can run the Docker build command. So in this case, we're going to tag the image with the name of the image registry, then a slash, and then the namespace inside the registry, then another slash, then the container name, and then we have a colon and the version number or tag. And then we indicate the directory of the Docker file, which is the current directory, and we hit enter. If you're not sending the image to a container registry, you can actually ignore the, in this case, au.icr.io slash rh part of the build image tag. You only need the hello world colon version 01. But because we're sending this image to a container registry, it just means that we don't have to re-tag it with the registry name and namespace later. Okay, so we've successfully built that. We can have a look at our images. So here you can see at the very top of the list, we have our latest container image that was created. It says about a minute ago. And just below that, where it says none is actually the build container. So you can see the significant difference in size between the two, and we can remove that image as well if we like. All right, now we can start the image that we've just built. So in this case, we're running with the detached option, which is dash D. We're using dash P to map the host port 7000 to port 3000 inside the container. And then we're specifying the full container name with the tag at the end, which is version 0.1 in this case. So let's check that. And there we go, easy enough. Now let's take a look at a couple of other things before we move on to the builder example. Let's take a look at the layers of the image that we just built. To do that, we can use a tool called Dive. So just remember, we're actually only looking at the production container that we built now because the build container was discarded. So on the left-hand side of the screen, you have the ability to now scroll through each of the different layers and you can see the impact that each layer has had on the right-hand side of the screen. So the first few layers are just a result of the from node 14 Alpine directive. But then as we move down, we can see that we have this APK add stress NG. So if I move to the other pane, you can change the filters with the command down the bottom. So this way we can see what the, uh, the that APK add stress NG command has actually done to the container image. So it's gone through and added all these files. We can come back, we can see that the workdir directive has just added a slash app to the file system tree. Again, we can play around with the filters. So if I turn on unmodified and turn it off, you can see that there's majority unmodified for this particular layer. The only thing that has been added is the app. And again, we then copy in files directly to the app directory. So you can see at this layer, the app directory has been modified with the contents that has been added, which is node modules folder, then .next, and then public. So it's a handy tool just to keep an eye on what's happening at each of the layers of your images. And if you're having any problems with like image sizes or anything like that, it's very handy to open up this dive interface and have a look at where all the storage is being used. So we can get out of that. And lastly, let's take a closer look at what our image looks like in OCI format. So we looked at this a little bit earlier, but I didn't show you how to actually get that OCI format on disk. So we can have a quick look at that now. I actually use a tool called Scopio to do that. And all we're doing is copying the image directly from the Docker daemon and writing it to the local disk in OCI format. Okay, and now we can see that we have this hello world directory here, and we can see that it's the exact same format that we had when we looked at it earlier. Okay, so there's obviously much more to Docker files than what we've been through here, but 
I think that's probably all you need to get started with building using them. So let's move on to building the exact same container, but using the builder tool instead. So builder is a little different to Docker and Podman. It's really only used to build, push and sign container images. So unlike Docker, but I guess similar to Podman, Builder doesn't rely on a central daemon and also doesn't require root access, which makes it really convenient to run, uh, especially for things like CI, CD in OpenShift, where Build is now actually used from version 4 onwards. Now, I'll go through all the Builder commands on the command line, but just keep in mind that it's definitely a lot more common to put these commands into a shell script for repeatable builds. And the Builder repo on GitHub actually has some really good examples on what those shell scripts look like. So you should probably check that out as well. Okay, so let's move over to our build machine now. So just quickly before we start, I just wanna point out that Builder is just like any other container engine. So it hooks into the same container cache as other OCI compliant tooling like Podman. And what that means is we can run the same commands and get the same results. Anyway, let's get into the building. So first up, you want to pull the latest demo app from GitHub. So I'll include the link for that in the description below. Uh, and you just want to obviously get a copy of this. I already have that cloned. You can see it's in the container hello world directory. Okay, now one of the cool things about Builder is that you can start from scratch. So that's literally scratch. So just an empty container image kind of goes like this. We can see that we're given back a name of working container. We can now mount this container and start making modifications to the image. So you can see we're currently sitting in an empty container. And I'll show you a really quick example on probably the key difference between Builder as opposed to something like uh, Docker. It's the ability to work more tangibly with containers in a different context. So specifically the context of the host. So we can do something like this. And you can see there that we've started from absolutely nothing, not a single file in the container and we've just installed a base root file system. So just to be clear on what happened there, we actually use the DNF command from our host. So the context of the host to install that root file system and we pointed it to the mounted directory of the container. So Docker can't do this when it's running a Docker build because it's running in the context of the container and therefore the container would have to have the DNF command inside it. Now I didn't take the path of starting from a scratch image uh, with the Docker file, pretty much just for convenience reasons. The Node.js images are already pre-made and they've got all the dependencies built in, but I just wanted to show you that you can do that. So let's go back to the Docker file and we're just going to replicate what we've done in the Docker file using the builder command line. Okay, so remember we are using two different containers here, one for the build and the other for the image that we're going to release. So basically in the first container, the build container, we move everything into it then we do the build and then we move only the assets needed at runtime to the release image that we've labeled prod. And of course that's using a smaller base image. In this case, it's using Node 14's Alpine release. Now remember this is just an example. It's probably not that necessary for a Node.js app, but if you're building an app with build dependencies that you don't want in your final image or building for multiple OSs, uh, this can become really necessary. So let's get started. Let's make our two containers. We can navigate back to home. So I'm going to call them C1 and C2 for container one and container two. And now we can mount these containers to environment variables that I'll call M1 and M2. So you can see now we have two different mounted file systems. Let's take a real quick look at a diff between the two. So as expected, we can see that the container based on the node 14 image includes a lot more content than the one based on node 14 Alpine release. Okay, so let's specify the environment variables for each of the containers. We can do that using the builder config command. So like I mentioned earlier, we can actually check the progress of our builder containers whilst we're still in the process of building them. So let's quickly check that those environment variables have taken effect. And at the top of the file here, we can see that the 
path and the node A and B has been set. Next up, we can set the work dir for container one. And then we want to copy the source code into the app directory. We can use the build a copy command for this. Okay, now that we have the source files copied over, we can now run the npm install command. Now that we have node modules available inside the container mount, we can now build the application. Now the way that I have to reference the binaries in the node modules directory here is slightly different to the docker file because of the way the environment is set up. Okay, so we should now be able to see that we've got the app built in the build container. We can see the .next directory that contains the compiled code. Now we can move back to the prod container. So next on the list there was to expose port 3000 TCP. And then we can install stressng. Okay, let's just check that that worked. That looks good. We can set the working directory to app again. Again, we can just confirm that this worked by checking build or inspect. Probably easier to use grep. Okay, and now we want to copy the compiled code from the build container into this production container. So we've set the working directory to app, but we should also just quickly make that directory as well. And we can copy the public directory I guess we can we can do it from the host if we want, just to show something different. Now we can set the entry point. And then we go to finish off the build process. We can just commit the container image. We can see at the top there that the container was created. And as always, we can run the container to test it. And there we go, we end up with the same result. Now we just wanna clean up a little bit after ourselves after using Builder. So you can see we still have the builder containers sitting around, so we can clean them up with the builder delete all command. And the mounts should no longer exist. And that's that. So you can see it's more complicated than just using a Docker file for simple builds. But when you're getting into the nuts and bolts of your builds and you really need to customize things or inject secrets or you know also have software installed from subscriptions that you have activated on the host itself, uh, outside of the container, then Builder can really help. So it's also worth noting though that Builder can be used to build containers via a Docker file too. So you can use the BUD option, which is build using Docker file. And I'll just kill that off there. And of course, you don't have to use a Docker file, you can use a container file as well. So we can just move this Docker file back to a container file, and we can run the exact same command. I'll just change the name. And you can see that starts running as well immediately. So Builder will pick up anything called a Docker file or a container file when running Builder with the build using Docker file option. So the Docker file's advantage is that it's simple and easier to reason about, in my opinion. Um, but Builder does bring two advantages to the table that Docker the, the Docker file can't. So you can check on your progress inside the container image as you move through your different stages of build like we did, and therefore obviously get immediate feedback like we did. With a Docker file, it's more of just run and forget. You don't have any control over what's happening in between the steps. Another advantage of Builder is that whilst you can, you don't always need to use multi-stage builds and move content between containers to keep the sizes low. And that's because you do have the ability of using tools that are only present on the host to make changes inside the container. 
uh, like we saw when we created that file system from the scratch image. We used DNF that was available on the host, but nothing was available inside the container. If you have time to join me in the next video of the series, we're going to be looking at distributing this container image that we just created using a container registry. So we'll take a deeper dive into both container registries and what they provide, as well as the tooling around them. So we'll look deeper into Scopio, Docker, and Podman. So thanks again, and bye for now.